Good afternoon. I'm uh, Patricia Kane, the Friends of American Arts at Yale, Curator of American Decorative Arts, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this lecture, which celebrates a momentous event. This week, the Yale University Art Gallery opens the Leslie P. and George H. Hume American Furniture Study Center and the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Sack Family Archive in the Collections Study Center at Yale West Campus. For those of you in the audience who have labored away in the original furniture study in the bowels of 149 York Street, you know how it's exciting it is for us to have a new home for this extraordinary facility. Before I tell you a little bit more about the um, new furniture study, I'd like you, if you have cell phones, to please silence them. This furniture study was actually created in 1959 by uh, Myrick R. Rogers, who was then the curator. And he thought of it as a really a three-dimensional textbook of American furniture. So this year is its 60th anniversary. It now houses furniture dating from 1650 to the present, and roughly half that furniture uh, is from the Mabel Brady Garvin collection. It also houses uh, tools and examples of joinery techniques that illuminate the craft practice, and it uh, also has about um, 200 examples of contemporary uh, wood turning and other wood art. So the relocation of this facility from uh, downtown New Haven to West Campus really accomplished a number of important goals for us. It provides a much safer environment for the long-term preservation of the collection, and it provides a lot better access to the collection. There are objects such as 30 examples of architectural woodwork that we uh, have never had on view before. And um, in the new furniture study, the heavier items are on movable pallets, so they're much easier to make accessible for classes and other kinds of demonstrations. In addition, it's very close to the Margaret and Angus Wordle Study Center for small three-dimensional objects and the conservation lab. So this encourages collaborations um, that will advance the study of American uh, decorative arts. And then the adjacency to the Bass family, um, the Bass Sack family archive. Um, this is an extraordinary collection of material from the Israel Sack firm that um, enables really in-depth study of American furniture. So our weekly tours, which we present on Fridays at 12.20, will resume uh, this coming Friday, um, September 13th. Um, and there is a schedule of these highlight tours and special um, subject tours that will take place in the fall. Uh, if you did not get a sheet of those um, uh, events, uh, they're available in the back of the room as you um, uh, exit the art gallery. And we are very grateful to the Oswaldo Rodriguez Roque Memorial Lecture Fund for supporting this celebratory lecture. Um, the fund was established by a very generous gift from the Chipstone Foundation and by family, friends, and colleagues in memory of Oswaldo, who died in 1989. Oswaldo was really a brilliant Yale student. He got his BA here in 1972 and his MA in 1975, and he spent many hours in the original furniture study. Uh, the Rodriguez family have, been, have faithfully attended these events over the years, and we are pleased to welcome today his brother, his sister, and uh, four of Oswaldo's nieces. So our lecture and presentation uh, today is by Stephen P. Latta, who is a professor of cabinet making and wood technology at Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, he received his BA from Ohio University in uh, English literature and then completed a master's degree in American studies at Pennsylvania State University. 
Steve has been a longtime contributor to uh, the magazine Fine Woodworking and is its current contributing editor. And in addition to uh, publishing and lecturing wise, widely, he is also a consultant for, the tool, for tool development with the Lye Nelson Toolworks in Warren, Maine. Steve's presentation is titled Shells for Inlaying for Sale on Very Moderate Terms, Furniture Inlay in Federal America. And this draws on the research for his master's degree and on his skill as a maker. It will demystify the making of inlay while providing uh, many insights into its rich and diverse history in early America. So please join me in welcoming Steve Lotta to the podium. <laughs> Okay, uh, first off, I'd really like to thank um, Patricia Kane and the folks from Yale for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, when I started out as a cabinet maker back in the mid 80s, it's safe to say that this was not one of the places I thought that I would end up. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really thrilled, really thrilled and honored to be here. Um, my intent over the next hour is to spend 15 minutes or so talking about the business, the practice, some of the makers of inlay during the federal period, and then spend an hour or so demonstrating some of the techniques uh, that were used during the period, and hopefully demystify uh, some of the practice. We'll follow that up with a question and answer period. But if anybody has questions during it, feel free to ask them out. Um, I just kind of like to have a dialogue going. It makes it easier, I think, actually, for me. So I mentioned um, we all know federal furniture, and we celebrate it for its wonderful neoclassic designs and its rich um, and colorful ornamentation, particularly inlay. But we don't spend a lot of time talking or understanding uh, the people who did it and how it was practiced. So what surprises a lot of people, if you look at these advertisements, the pictorial elements, the ovals, the stringing, the bandings, these were not being made domestically. They were being imported from London and Liverpool. Very little of it was actually being made here uh, when we first started out. And they're talking about importing shells, stringing, fancy ornaments, and this is what they mean. These were being made in England and shipped over here in terms of banding and shells and all of that, and then, and then put on the furniture. Um, in 1985, or I'm sorry, 1785, a little bit of a difference there, we see this Edward Godier in Charleston saying that, he's ad, that he has hired a cabinet maker, comma, inlayer to work on furniture. Now, because of that comma, I don't know if it's the same person or a separate person. But what it's showing is it's being done here at, in the colony, or in the States at this point, being worked out. 26 years later, in 1811, we have Porter Blanchard, who is in New Hampshire, advertising that he wants to train employees in, the, in banding and stringing making. So it, it's still happening you know, a quarter century later. Um, Furniture the, itself tells a story. You look at the tooling and how it's been done. It has its own little ballad to tell. Now, this is a tall case clock that was made in, it believed to be made in southeast Massachusetts around 1800, um, photos courtesy of Andrew Richmond. And this inlay that you see right here, okay, you find it on the door in the four corners and on the, the base in the four corners. And what Andrew did is I had him photograph these for me and mail them to me, email them to me. And when you look at them, they come together as a perfect disc. So whoever the make, case maker was, he wasn't making these things, he was buying them. Somebody came by and sold him a couple of these discs. He quartered them, 
set them on the clock, and, and moved forward. So these weren't being made in-house. These are the kind of things that were being imported from, from, uh, from England. Oops. Oh. I pushed the wrong button. There we go. Slight panic. OK. Now, <laughs> hey, it's a little nerve-wracking, I have to say. All right, now this is a card table that's owned by Winterthur. And um, it's, I mean, I hate to say this, but it's not a particularly attractive table. Uh, the proportion, the, the aprons are too heavy. It, it's, it's out of proportion. But if you look at it, all of the inlays on it, the floral, this is called a squid inlay, these bell flowers, which are fielded. If, if you look at it, it, imagine basically buying decals. You're making the table. You go down to the supplier. I'll talk about one of those people shortly. You buy your stuff, you bring it home, and you put it on your table. The way the veneer is applied to the apron is vertically grained, which does give a nice visual, your eyes move up. But it's also the easiest way to put veneer on an apron. So we have this wonderful table, which is basically prefabricated out of parts. Now granted, it's 200 some years later and sitting in winter. So that's not a bad history to end up with. Uh, this is a sideboard that I really like. This is in uh, the furniture study. And it's a beautiful piece, Maryland, about 1800. And you can see all the beautiful inlays. And we have shells going across the front. These are the shells. What do you notice about them? You have three that match in an oddball. So obviously, they weren't being made for that particular sideboard. I imagine the cabinet maker went to his drawer and said, yeah, three of these, yeah, they'll never know. <laughs> and went ahead and put them on. And it wasn't until I was doing my graduate work you know, 15 or so years ago that I photographed and said, wow, these don't match. And I have found that on several other pieces, card tables and such, where the pattern do not match. So what that tells you is they weren't being made in the shop. They certainly weren't being made for the piece. They were probably just purchased from the local inlay guy and, and, and then put on. So um, I keep hitting the wrong button. So who, who were these guys? And I want to talk about two of them in particular to give you an idea of how the practice was. You know, we were always thinking about artists and such. These guys were tradesmen. They were craftsmen. They're trying to make a living and feed their families. Um, one of them was Thomas Barrett. And he was in Baltimore, and he died, I believe, in 1801. Now, Thomas Barrett his, was a, just a wonderful resource, because they have his sales ledgers. They have his inventory when he passed away. They have who showed up at the auction and bought his estate bought the articles from his estate. So we have lots of information on him. And he is one of only two cabinet makers, inlay makers, that actually referred to himself as an ebeniste, which is a French term referring to an artisan who has had f more formal training in veneer work. It's a sort of a step above being a typical cabinet maker. And the only other guy was Francis Garish, who trained under Thomas Barrett, but was nowhere near in the same uh, league. So. Why do I have an image of a table made by Levin Tarr, attributed to Levin Tarr, on the same slide? Well, guess whose name was all over his ledger as being a customer? Levin Tarr and probably 25 of Baltimore's leading cabinet makers were all in Barrett's sales journal. So this is a table made by Levin Tarr. Who did the inlay? Probably Thomas Barrett. Probably Thomas Barrett. We, nowadays, we think of craftsmen sort of as, as having to do everything themselves. They do all of the carving on the piece, all of the inlay, everything. And it's somehow, t today's sensibility, cheating if you somehow don't do it all. That was not the case back then. This was the age of the specialists. There were gilders, inlayers, carvers, upholsterers. And everybody had their little special niche. And um, one piece might be the work of five, six different people. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, 
This is furniture of the Bankson and Lawson shop. And I have to give thanks to the research for this to um, Gregory Weedman, Michael Flanagan, and Sumter Pretty, who did a wonderful research on this years ago in the Chipstone Journal. But, but in any case, these pieces are from the shop of Banks and Lawson, which was undoubtedly Baltimore's most prestigious shop. I mean, look at the quality of this work. It, it is simply outrageous. And what happened, they dissolved their partnership around 1792. And in seven, so as soon as that happened, Banks and immediately started a, a shop, another sh partnership with a fellow named Richardson. So it was Banks and Richardson. And that shop went until 1795 when they dissolved that partnership. And the year that that partnership dissolved, the following year of that dissolution, three cabinet makers appeared on the rolls, the Baltimore tax rolls. Thomas Barrett, John Gagne, and another inlay maker named William Patterson. So it is safe to speculate that perhaps these people were employed by Bankson and Lawson, and then Bankson and Richardson. We know Barrett was because, um, or not so, we know Patterson was because he was actually apprenticed to the shop in, in 1789. So, this is the original inventory of Thomas Barrett when he passed away. Look at this. 1,192 shells for inlaying. That's a pretty good inventory. And by shells, they mean those little pictorials. Now, he only had 76 yards of banding. That's not much. And a yard of banding, when you're purchasing banding, this is ornamental banding, we'll talk about this in a bit, you purchase it by the yard. So, and he had an estate valued of about $1,600, which was very good for the time. Now, here's the auction. Here's the auction. 791 yards of banding. All of a sudden we have 700 plus extra yards. Where did it come from? Well, I would suspect, this is my own belief, he had an order placed coming in from London. And it came in, he had already passed away, they just included it in the inventory, and then it was auctioned away. Average at a seven and a half cents a yard. Now, half the shells disappeared, but here we are selling 540 shells for 18 and a half cents a piece. Okay, that's these little decorative things. Now, first off, if you look at all these names, Patterson, Anthony Law, Davidson, Thomas Combe, these are all the top cabinet makers in Baltimore. So they were like piranha coming in for the kill. You know, <laughs> Here's the stuff for sale, and they're showing up to stock their inventories. Um, and I said, Anthony Law was probably the most successful cabinet maker in Baltimore. When he died, he had an estate of over $15,000, which for the time period was just, was just huge. But you know, I said, um, these sold for 18 and a half cents a piece. Look at those nine. Anthony Law paid $1.10 for nine inlays, six times the price. What must they have been? Well, they may have been these types of things. Um, the more formal, full, rot you know, full discs, uh, fancy stuff that he was willing to pay six times the price for. So it's actually quite an investment. But so Barrett was providing everyone with their inlay. Now, if you look at that, um, that, sh that um, sales ledger, William Patterson was buying quite a bit. He bought 120 inlays that day. Uh, two days after the auction, two days after the auction, he's advertising that he has commenced the practice of inlay making. <laughs> and he is selling shells, bandings, and all of this. And uh, we, we know from, Barrett, or from Patterson's background that he was more than capable of producing the work. But he was a good businessman. There was a hole in the market. There was a demand for it. So he set up practice. And um, there he goes, two days after the auction. He probably needed inventory to get started, and there it was. Now, another set of inlay makers I want to talk about briefly are 
John and George Dewhurst. John Dewhurst arrived in the, um, Boston in 1781. At the time, he was 63 years old. And he set up a shop in Boston, um, and he called it uh, Dewhurst, John Dewhurst Cabinet Maker. In about 1805, it changed to Dewhurst and Sons. Okay, and Son, rather. And uh, the son was John, who was 20 years old when he, 21 years old when he arrived in Boston. So they went from being um, cabinet makers to being stringing makers. So they had specialized their market, and were now just doing inlays and that type of thing. And it stayed that way through, you know, 1806, 1807. Now, at a certain point. It's no longer Dewhurst and Sons, it's just Dewhurst. And the son has left. And it stayed that way through 1817 when John finally passed away. Um, and he started with $200 inventory, and he died with $200 of inventory. So he didn't get rich at this by any stretch of the imagination. But as the market changed, he went from being a stringing maker back to being a cabinet maker because he had to adapt his business to succeed. So what happened to George? Where did George go? Um, this is an advertisement placed by William Vance, who was a plane maker in Baltimore. And he places this in 1806. And he basically states that, I'm importing inlays for sale from Dewhurst and Sons, Boston. So inlays are being shipped in from Boston to Baltimore for the Baltimore market. And apparently it was a good market because in 1808, George is opening a manufactory in Baltimore with a man named Colson who also did business with Vance. So George has gone from Boston to Baltimore, and now he's making inlays in Baltimore, developing a market there. And he stayed in Baltimore till about 1811. In 1812, following the migration west, he showed up in Lexington, Kentucky. And he stayed there for about four years, I think three or four years. And then, once again, following the traffic of people, he ends up in New Orleans. Now, this is an indenture agreement where George is apprenticing his son, John, named after his father, to an ornamental painter in New Orleans. So now his son is going into the trade. And he says that the son was born in Baltimore. So he stayed there till about 1823 when he passed away. He had a natural death, as opposed to apoplexy, pneumonia, consumption, dysentery, pleurisy. Sounds like a great place to live, doesn't it? Um, great place to live. But, so, but I want to just show you this. And this is, at this point, it's pure speculation. This is a banding. It's a very complicated banding to make. Um, it's called the domino banding. And this image is from Vernon Stoneman's book on Seymour furniture. OK, it's a very unique banding. Now, if we look at these pieces, this is a Massachusetts card table, 1800, a Maryland sideboard dated between 1790 and 1820, and an AMA in New Orleans in 1820. So there's a domino banding on the card table. There's a domino banding on the sideboard. There's a domino banding on the AMA. So there are no pieces signed by George Dewhurst. And it's maybe just pure coincidence. But wherever George goes, this banding seems to go with him. And it's a very, very unique, uh, very, very unique design. But our purpose today is to talk about we have a problem. Oh, there we go. Maybe battery's dying. I don't know. This piece. Now, this is a um, 
card table. It's part of the, the collection here in the art gallery. It's, it's a, a New York card table. It's, it's a uh, very nice piece, and it has a lot of inlay on it that I want to demonstrate to you folks. Um, here's a front view of it. And what I'd like to start with demonstrating is the, uh, is the stringing on the leg. So if we could change over to the camera for live work, uh, that would be wonderful. All right. Ooh. All right. So we'll come here. So if we think about that stringing, give you a chance to. We need to change over from the PowerPoint, please. There we go. Thank you. Right here. We're good. All right, so this is Holly, Holly Veneer. And this is a slicing gauge. So I'm going to slice off. This is how stringing is made. And I'm also going to say this is how I make stringing. There is no book. There is no manual, 1800 manual, of inlay. So people are self-taught, myself included. And um, so this is how I go about it. So this is a piece of stringing, wonderful material. And this is a small tool for thicknessing it. So I can pull it through here. And see that? It scrapes it to a specific thickness. You can see that shaving coming off, I hope. All right. So this is how stringing is made, or how I make it. And I've got this leg started for us. So in doing the inlay on this leg, inlay is traditionally a series of straight lines and arcs. And tools are used to cut these in. So for these large arcs, if we look at this, this is a cutter. This is a mock-up of a cutter. And basically, it's a simulation for this piece of steel that I have here that I filed two teeth into to cut the arc. And you can see how I used it to cut this line that I then filled, uh, filled with stringing. So. And we have a similar tool. This is a straight line tool, which has three teeth. And it was used for, um, for cutting the straight lines on here. But to show how this is done, let me see if I can get my hand out of the way. It's just scoring a line and cutting right down. Whoops. Right down. Is that coming through? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I, I did make all these tools. But the thing I want to stress is, you know, I figured this out. They figured it out. Maybe the same way, maybe differently. Um, people bring to the table whatever their backgrounds are. So this this worked for me. So that's why I tend to do it this way. Yes. Yeah, that's an important um, part because a lot of times people tend to do these with scratch docs. And the problem with scratch docs is they don't work well against the grain. They tend to tear a lot more. All right. So I have my little groove here. I've torn, I've cut my piece. 
a little more thinning. Come on. There. A little bit of clean up. And, you know, when you think about it, it was really neat back then. Just saying, like, in, in Baltimore. You know how you go to New York, there's the, uh, there's the garment district and all of that? Well, it was the same thing. So all of the cabinet makers and such were in the same area. So they were all borrowing from each other. It must have been a really, really creative environment at the time. Really creative environment. And um, to, to give you an idea, too, of how this practice was done, there is the, um, every city had their own one. It was called the Book of Prices. And what it basically determined was, how, I'm going to cheat and use modern day glue for the sake of time. But what the Book of Prices was, the shop owners determined how much time something should take, and consequently, how much they were going to be willing to pay for it. And the result of that was basically the, the book of prices in terms of what they would pay. And the best way to give you an idea of how that worked, if any of you have ever taken your car to the dealership, the mechanics there are working on what's called book rate, which means they're going to get paid to do a brake job so much money. And if they get it done very quickly, they make more money. If it takes a long time because every nut's frozen and everything, they make a lot less money. So this is how the practice was um, done in urban settings at the time. So that's just scratched. And I'm using, well, this is an aliphatic resin, but what it typically would have been used is high glue. And I will have some of that out uh, in a bit. But then it's just flush to the surface. And that gives you an idea. This is just a little hand, this is just a little hand plane. And this could be done with a chisel, just as easily upside down is often done. It could have been done with a card scraper. Any, any number of things um, would, would work well for that. Now, if you look at um, a lot of inlay, okay, this was an uh, interpretation of this leg that I did some years ago. They often have a lot of little balls and such. That's often where things don't line up properly. <laughs> okay, if it doesn't quite line up, we're just going to put a berry there. You know, that'll look nice. But we have this, this bellflower, all right? Now, a bellflower is made a variety of ways. This is a, a bellflower stack where the many layers of veneer were put together and then using what's called a bird's mouth, and a fret saw, these pieces would have been cut out. And when you do it that way, you end up, basically what's nice is you're cutting multiples at the same time. So when I'm doing a job, this would be a typical case of bellflowers. So I would cut them all out at one time. This particular representation you see here is for a card table leg that I'm working on right now that has three different sized ones. So you cut out all of your pieces, get them you know, together, and then uh, install them as, as you go. So, but that's how those types of bellflowers would be made. Um, there are other types of bellflowers as well. Some are made differently. Um, This is just a piece of veneer. Once again, the holly veneer 
allow me to move my leg. Hands on. Hands on. And they were expected to get, I think, six pieces per inch, which is amazing when, when you think about it. Um, workers often came from the orphan's court. So if you had a shop and you needed some people to train, in Baltimore you would go down to the orphan's court and get an orphan and train them, which sounds kind of crass, but at the same point, you're giving them a trade, and that trade will give them a livelihood. So they're grateful for it. So if you tell that apprentice in you know, such time that you need to slide, slice six pieces per inch, and if you don't, you're going back, <laughs> and I'm getting another one, um, it's a good incentive. So people take their skills much seriously. So I've sliced off this strip, and this is just a gouge. And you can see how, by using a gouge, I can just punch off petals and quickly get them, all right? And I just, I just pop them out. And these are the type, you know, once again, this is, I don't know if this is going to shine, but this is a set for a bell flowers for a typical leg. And for that, we would be looking at, this is a, um, this is a Baltimore leg. I don't know if you can see it. Typical Baltimore bell flowers right here, OK? These are typical Baltimore bell flowers. You can see how they're punched out. But what's interesting is these are Massachusetts bell flowers, OK? And this is one of those regional things that holds true. In the mid-Atlantic, the center petal always goes in last. In New England, the center petal always goes in first. It's just one of those things that just seems to pre prove true again and again and again and again. But these are more traditional bellflowers. And I, I do want to say just briefly that these take a lot of time. These take a lot of time to do. But you're trying to fill the leg. So in this case of the New York leg we're doing right now, we're putting stringing in there. Stringing goes a lot faster. Then maybe you throw one bellflower in. So these are two legs um, originating out of the New Hampshire area. And it's the same principle. The pivot points are off the leg. You swing your arcs, you fill it in. And what's nice from a, from a craftsman's point of view is you can fill a lot of space to the same amount of space it would take to do bellflowers much more quickly, and uh, which transfers to affordability and, and, and all of that. So we're often doing stringing for the purpose of um, filling a space inexpensively, inexpensively. So, but in a nutshell, um, that's how we go about doing stringing, making stringing and, and setting it in. Any, any questions on that? Yes, sir. So the teal on that end leg is blue, and I've been noticing a lot of faded color. Mm -hmm. Is there any documentation of what the color of blue was or the blue of the reef? <sighs> they, they have samples where they've taken pieces off and they've been more blue than green. And blue degrades to, you know, so I don't know. I, I don't know, but yeah, um, blue is a very neoclassic color. I, I, I will say that. Um, can we go back to the PowerPoint for just a moment? Now, is that up? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and it's fun. It's fun, Ban bannings particularly. OK, now these are the cuffs on this leg. And when I first um, you know, thought I would do this piece, focus on this piece, like, oh, this is great. I've done a lot of this before, so it, it should be um, fairly easy. And um, one of the associates here, I, I asked for a, a favor if they could take a picture of the cuff for me. And it arrived, and I said, that's not how I do it. Because if you look at my cuff, this is a standard cuff that I've done many times. 
the grain is running this way. On this cuff, the grain is running the other way. So it was like, oh, OK. Let's try to reinvent it. So could we play the little hyperlink? Would that be OK? This is a quick little two-minute two video on how this was made. Hoping this works. OK, good. So we're slicing off strips here using the same slicing gauge and just cutting off little strips. Cutting the pieces. Now this is high glue. This is the traditional high glue, which is heated to about 140 degrees using veneer pins as clamps. So this is more of a, what would be considered parquetry. Once again, slicing off. Yes, keeping it from buckling. That's why the purpose of the ruler. And the pieces are reassembled. That's why I made this. This is a lot to do. This is a quick little way of representing it. So how gradually is that? Uh, well, you watch when I pop it off. It's not that fragile. So it, it comes off as a unit. No hand modeling jobs for me. But this yields the same grain orientation that is on the, um, the leg from the collection here. And that's it. So that's how it's We can end this now, please. OK, great. You can end this. There we go. Thank you. And I think we can actually. Go back to um, hands uh, hands on again. All right. So just to give you an idea, here is that same banding when you um, add the pieces to it. It gives it that that depth. So, all right. That's that's how that. And you know, see when, when I make up a banding. I make up like a full run. So this is a whole piece. And clearly, this was not how uh, that banding was, was made. So it, it, was, it was interesting in the ass. When I saw that grain, it was like, oh, change of course. But that's the fun stuff. You know, figuring things out is, is definitely the fun stuff. Now, the waist banding that was on this piece, and that's the piece at the bottom of the apron, what was different. Um, to give you an idea as to how that was made. So this is what the finished banding going around the waist looked like. I don't know if you can focus in on that. Kind of a crazy little banding. And well, you know. When you look at that, you go, oh, you know. Think of getting an apprentice to do that for you. I, I teach, so I get my freshman the first year. The first couple of weeks, they just drive you insane. So what you do is you tell the apprentice, all right, I'm going to show you how to make six inches of this. When you have two miles, come back. You know, and, and, and it just keeps them, keeps them going. So, but this is a pack. 
This is a core that would be laid up. So these are just various pieces sawn off in, in thicknesses. These are, I think, 50 thousandths each. These are three times that. And it was a definite ratio of one to three on these. And these pieces would be sawn off. Right, you can, I hope you can see that. So these are sawn off. And this is a little high glue. So I can lay these down. Not exactly an 18th century application tool, but, but this is called a rub joint, where you just put them together. And the high glue sets very, very quickly. So I can just run it across and build my pieces. So the thing is, to generate this core here, took about six inches of this pack. So I, I glued this up yay long, sliced off pieces, and I still probably have three or four more packs to go out of this one set. The same applies to this. So although these are very thin pieces, when you saw them off um, and lay them down, you get that full length. So it, it grows fairly quickly. So those would be put together, these would be put together, and then it would be set on top. And that would give you this arrangement. And that's just how it's done. Now, for I just, just to give you an idea of how this works, these were all sawn at 90 degrees across the core. I brought another sample banding with me to show you where it's the exact same idea, only instead of sawing the pieces at 90 degrees, they were sawn at 45 degrees and then put together. But it's, the only thing different is the angle of the cut. Yes? This is this. This is about a thirty second. Well, a heavy thirty second. Then it gets sliced off that way. Yes, and then they. It, and then, as you, as we said earlier, it is sold by, by yards. It is sold yards of banding. So, it's so on. Well, when you do it all day, every day. Uh, I mean, this is a specialty trade. So this is what they learned. Um, watching a skilled carver just knocking out the drooning, it's the same idea. It's just it's what they do. So um, I, I will tell you with all honesty, I don't hand saw these. <laughs> you know, I tend to use saws that have motors a lot of the times. And it, it just makes it go. So, um, so anyway, so this is how the banding is produced. And there's just a whole myriad of designs. We know the lunettes and all of that. And I'll be talking a lot more about bandings tomorrow uh, over at the study. But it's just, you know, there was a demand for it, and people generated it. Um, now, one thing that has not changed, um, to this day, there are still companies, Dover Inlay is one of them, where for probably, Four dollars, you can buy a strip of this. So, with a shop, with a typical shop rate these days of seventy-five dollars an hour, you have less than a minute. You, know, you have like three minutes to make it. So why would you? They just buy it from a specialist, specialist as as they did back then, as they did back then. All right. Any any other questions on? Oh, yes. Um, they died. Most, they, they dyed the stuff. Um, some pieces, they would use ebony, but ebony is so expensive. 
that why would you use it for, for bandings um, when, the, when you could die veneers, typically pear wood. And um, a lot of the bandings that are curved that go around, say, a dressing table or whatever, um, ebony's not very bendable. Ebony is very, very, very brittle. So it tends not to bend very well. You, you had a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, could you uh, uh, talk a little bit more about the tooth pattern on that tool? Or the, the, the tooth orientation? For which tool? The, the tool that cut the groove for the band. For the stringing, specifically. For the stringing, sure. For the straight line, the teeth would look like that. Okay? For the radius tool, they would look like two teeth. And the narrower the teeth, the tighter the radius. Um, because when you're doing a straight line, turning's not an issue, you can afford to have a, a wider cutter. But these are just large representations of the same thing. And that's just, you know, in modern day, if you're familiar with a card scraper, yeah. this is just a chunk of card scraper snapped off, filed and snapped off. And then three teeth filed in this one and two teeth filed in this one. As opposed to a scratch stock, which is just, a, a straight tool. And, and scratch stocks do not do well on curves. So, but um, that's just the way I go about doing it. I'm not saying it is the way to do it. It's just the way that I do it. Um, so, like I said, people came here. When I started as a cabinet maker and moved to Pennsylvania to the Philadelphia area, the shop I went to work in it was because I wanted to do period furniture. That's why I moved from Ohio. They had a carver, they had a turner, they had a gilder. They, they didn't have an inlay person. So I picked up the trade um, for the same reason the apprentice did forever ago, job security, <laughs> feed the family. Yeah, well, that's, that's the reality of it. I mean, that, that, that really is the reality of it. So, other questions? Yes? You had that workhorse that got the right and you were running the- Correct. Mm -hmm. Did you find the same like three or four knives coming out of the shop? So they didn't have to make a bunch of tools or thought a bunch of tools. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, bell flowers typically consist of maybe two different gouges. And by overlapping it, see the beautiful thing about doing a bell flower that way, all right, if I'm um, setting bell flowers in. The tool that I will use, and I'm not sure this is the right tool, but the tool that I will use to punch out that veneer will be the same tool that I will use to punch the surface. They're guaranteed to match. They're guaranteed to match. And if I go to a smaller bellflower, I can run my cutter up into where the berry's going to be, and you'll have those tool marks. But when you drill the hole and, and fill the, um, the berry in, the tool marks are taken away. So um, it, it, it's very, you know, I mean, I, what I'm trying to do here is to demystify. Um, for clients, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so you, you don't want to do that. You, you love them to think every one of those pieces of banding were like, yeah. which would be in, insane, but, but, but that would be the reality of it. To, um, and to put a piece of, of, of banding in, you would simply Yes. Correct. Right. I just angle it. I just angle it. And um, another truthful aspect of that is hide glue does an absolutely phenomenal job of, of, of filling. It really does. It, it really does. Um, and if you look at a lot of original inlay, it's really not very good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's not. We have, we have a much higher standard now of what we expect people to do. Um, 
and it, it's just something that has to be dealt with. So I would make my first line. make a second line, and just a series of cuts. And the whole purpose here is to just pretty much take away the structural integrity of the fibers so that they really don't have any much left to them. You can see it's already starting to break out. And then not that, just, can you catch this over here? But then with the chisel, But, the, I mean, the thing that you need to realize, when this was actually being done, there were disputes between shop owners and workers about who paid for the candles to light the shop. This was not a warm and fuzzy, necessarily, work environment. This was people, you know, trying to make a living. And um, people bickering over who was going to pay for what. So if I'm, if I'm going to set this in, this is a small router plane. And I would take my piece of banding, set both down. See how I'm straddling it? That helps me set the depth. Tighten it down. And then just come back. And this would set the final depth. We call it a router plane. No. An old woman's tooth. That's interesting. Well, okay, so um, this looks like a you know a very nice little tool and all that. Okay, so. And then the banding would just, would, would just go in. And that's not a very good fit, but the camera's awfully very big there, too. So, but that would be the idea of setting it in. Um, people, you can do the same thing by taking a block of wood, running a old-style wood screw in with a sharp edge, and they use the edge of the screw to, to achieve the same purpose. It's just a little router plane. Pardon? So have you ever used in the oh, yeah, yeah. Totally different. And not trying to be, I wouldn't use Cuban for a demonstration. So it, it's, I just wouldn't. I'm sorry. I don't have that, you know. It, it's so hard to get anymore. It, it's, and it, it is so expensive. It, it is so expensive. So that, that's how the bandings would be made uh, and, and put in. A hair proud, just a hair proud. Whenever you're setting anything in, you want it to be a hair proud because you want to take your inlay to the surface, not the surface to your inlay because that's going to lead into things being scalloped up. Um, something like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Chester County Line and Berry inlay with the compass work. Um, a mistake that's often made with that is pieces are put in, the surface is sanded, more is put in, it's sanded, and it's sanded three or four times. And then the first coat of finish goes in, it's just bounce, the light's bouncing everywhere because the surface is totally dished out. So you have to be very careful about touching the background um, as, opposed to, as opposed to anything else. So, okay, let's talk 
a little bit about pictorials. Um, so. Oh, thank you. Okay, bring a few things forward. So, um, patter or ornamental ovals. These were the things that were heavily imported um, from London and Liverpool. There is a huge skill jump from going from doing um, simple ways to doing simple ways of, of doing a, a, top, a pilaster of a leg and pictorials. And just if you for here for a second. So these would be imported. This would be an example of an imported inlay. Pardon my head. As would these. This is a thistle, lily in the valley. Um, th these are what you would expect to see in an urban setting, Baltimore, Boston, uh, New York, because they were coming in readily, ready made. Um, this particular banding that we're going to be looking at here, which is on the card table in, in the collection, is found all along the entire eastern seaboard. It is not regional to one area at all. And uh, years back, I was watching Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> and it was the Kino brothers. And they were talking about, they were up somewhere, I think, in St. Louis. And it was a warehouse of English furniture that they had imported in. And they were showing some of the inlays. And it was the same inlay. <laughs> so the inlay was in England. And it had come over here. Um, and it was all along in the eastern seaboard. So like I said, these are the sort of things that you would see in the cities. If you were in more rural areas, these are the type of things that you might see. Because they knew that they had to fill that area. But they didn't have access to that. So they came up with their own methods. These are both um, New Hampshire. Actually, all three of these are New Hampshire inlays. Um, they came up with their own way of doing it. And quite frankly, I find it really imaginative. I think it's wonderful stuff. They knew they had to put something there, and they came up with this. Um, Nathan Lombard, who was um, from uh, Massachusetts, did variations on this many times, and it was just really, really pretty stuff. Really, really pretty stuff. But it's quick, and it's easy to execute, and it, uh, it fills the space, which is what the intent was. So, but, so for pictorials, um, imagine that I would put a pack together. So this would be a pack. And a pack would consist of the, the, the veneer that you're going to see, the background, possibly a piece on the underside to keep from chipping and tearing out something for reinforcement. And the pattern would be either on the top with a pounce pad, meaning that they would have a pattern with all the little holes punched in it, and they'd set it down and hit it with like talc chalk, and it would transfer the pattern and then it would be cut out. Um, cut out once again using a method of perhaps a bird's mouth where the pack would just be, you know, the pieces would be sawn out and then set down. Um, in Europe, there was a tool called a chevalet that I know was used in France and I know was used in England. It's a fairly sophisticated tool. It is not something people would casually put to the side. And they've never found one in, in uh, America at the time period. So maybe Barrett had one. I, I don't know. 
But so the pieces would be then cut out. And like I said, this would be a pack for this inlay, which is uh, one that's often found in the Carolinas. So a piece will be cut out, and the pieces will be put together. And this is where you don't want to lose your pieces. I remember when I was first starting to do this stuff, uh, I took a, a couple workshops off of people who I thought were very knowledgeable. And the first thing it says, before you start, sweep the floor. <laughs> so when the pieces go zinging, uh, you, you can see where they are. Now, all right. What we have here is hot sand. OK? So if I had been making this piece, knock all the pieces out. So here's the basic um, silhouette with all the pieces cut out. Well, see, you know, the thing is, if you're cutting everything out in two layers, it's guaranteed to match. So if you drift off your line, it's not going to matter because you've drift off your line for both pieces. OK, I see I've already lost my center dot. Oh, wells. We'll get over it. So we have our pieces here. Let me grab a little gouge. That's a double bevel cut. Yeah, that's a beveled cut. The question and the, what that refers to is um, by cutting at an angle, you have two pieces, OK? And you cut them at an angle. The idea is when you're done, this piece drops into this piece. And the angle, that the gap from the blade disappears, right? And if you glue it down so that the bevel of the background is locking the pieces in, they, they, don't, they don't come out then. So let me get my other things. All right. So hopefully my sand's not cooling down. But I can scoop up a little sand. And you see how, I think I talked too long. It starts to shade. That's the whole purpose of sand shading. I'm going to plug myself back in here. All right. So I can. Dip my pieces. And you know, sand shading is very critical because it what gives the piece its three-dimensional effect. It's used extensively on uh, on bell flowers as, as as well. So if you could perhaps focus in on these for a moment. The little bit of sand shading gives it a nice three-dimensional effect. Hopefully, my sand will come up to speed here. Yeah, it's just, well, at least we didn't blow a breaker. All right. Um, believe it or not, around 440 degrees. Why I know that, I'm not sure. But um, so by bringing the sand through this way, see how it just sits on the ring there? 
that works for, for just doing the, the ring. Although I just don't think I'm hot enough. We'll let that, let that heat up for a moment. And there, and there are various ways of, of doing this in that some people bring the temperature to a certain degree where um, it's really hot. And if they're doing bell flowers, they're dipping them, you know, one, two, three, four, and they just in and out, in and out, in and out. Some people go to a more moderate heat and will put in like 10 at a time. Sort of like they're mining their crop, they're checking them all, and you know, they, they're doing multiples uh, at one time. I tend to be of the make it very hot and, and put it in. So, but hoping this is heating up. And a lot of times when you're doing this, if I'm doing small pieces, um, all right, you see how that one's starting to break? A lot of times if you're doing small pieces, what, you cho what I choose to do is to scoop sand from a very hot point and then shade in the spoon. Because then if it comes off, I can recover it by just pouring the sand down and, and getting the piece off. Let's see if this, give this a chance to heat up, hopefully. Because I really would like you to see that. The spoon's hot, I'll tell you that. So now, so once, give that a moment or two. So what I tend to do with these is I'll reassemble it and I'll glue a layer of paper down and then I'll glue a backer on it, which is not the traditional way of doing it. But traditionally, the veneers were much thicker. And they're, they're just harder to get this way. So it would get to, say, this point where I have it. And I would slice off another piece of stringing. Oh, God, I have one. Strike off a piece of stringing and Just get it a little bit wet, give it a moment or two. And then I could take this and very carefully wrap it around my oval, okay? Wrap it around the oval. And if you look at this, there's one that I did earlier where you can see there's the stringing. And to put it on, I would give it a cut. and see where it needs to go. And then just with a layer of glue. So now we're tightening it up. Uh, yeah, just so it will hopefully stay. It will hopefully stay. You, you want to put it, so that looks good, you want to put it in a spot where it's least under pressure. So on the side, because of the bend of the arc, it would be more likely to spring open. So if you see, that, this is one that I did earlier for, the, for here. And you can see the split. Well, when you blow it up that big, it looks like a canyon. But... Um, <laughs> But, but there's the splice, you know, right there. And then this would be put on the leg, traced out with um, a knife. I use an X-Acto. A series of cuts would be made. And then using a router plane, 
I would just you know excavate it with the router plane. Pardon? Okay. <laughs> and then I would then I would just set it in and, and glue it in. So um, it, I, I think that look turns out very well. And um, if you think back to the advertisement, eighteen and a half cents. There you go. Um, today, five bucks. You can buy them for online. So I mean, the quality is markedly different. I I, I will say that, but um, markedly different. But the market, you know, is still there. There was a gentleman. I can't remember his his um, his name, but his last name, his first name, but his last name was French. And up until I think 1990, he operated a business in Boston, going from shop to shop like the snap-on man. You know, what do you need? I've got bandings, I've got, you know, what do you need? And uh, he used to joke that, you know, a lot of people know how to do this stuff. I put three kids through college doing this stuff. And that, that's quite a testimony when, when you think about it. You know, when you think about it. Pardon? So we should be done soon. Okay, that's what. I just wanted to. I wanted you guys to see the oh, oh, oh. a little bit there. Uh, the, um, all right. See how that's. There we go. See, we're getting the scorch finally. All right. All right. I wanted you to see that. I don't know. Um, well, put it this way: the pad array are all laser cut now. They're all laser cut. Um, and it is, I find, to be a little disappointing. But, but see, I still make on my own. Um, so, and then you bring it in. Yeah, there, there, we have a little bit of burn going on there. But, but that, see how that we're getting, we're getting that scorch now? That, that was the idea. That's the idea behind it. Well, what I try to do, what I try to do is set it so that with the bevel, the background is holding the pieces in. Um, but there are right and wrong sides. And as, as you say, and as I said before, the, in, the inlay tells a story. Um, there was a piece that is owned by the Williamsburg Collection. And it was um, a, a cabinet that had two shell inlays side by side. And on one of the pieces, one of them, the pieces were falling out. And underneath it was a layer of newsprint. And how it was misinterpreted originally was, oh, this is how they put them in. They glued the paper side down. There's the physical evidence supporting that. Well, that's why they fell out, <laughs> all right? And someone would say, well, why would they possibly do it that way? And see, the thing is, when you're making these things in bulk, you have all your pieces laid out. And if you're doing something like a lily of the valley where you know, the lilies are leaning this way, well, you have all your pieces laid out so the lilies are all leaning this way. And you put your paper down to bind it together. Well, federal people were so insane over symmetry that if on this side it's leaning this way, on this side it has to be leaning this way. So in order to make that happen, you have to transfer the paper. So you flip it over, put paper on one side, the other side, and hopefully, remember, to take the first layer of paper off. And if you don't, well, pieces start falling out. And, and I'm sure that that's what happened. I'm absolutely positive. That's what happened on that one. So time-wise, you're saying we're there? Oh, OK. So you want, we should be done then, right? OK. Um, so <laughs> all right. Well, you know, these things can go on forever. Um, and, we, and I know we have time. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? Um, I didn't really bring those, but actually, I was going to show you one signature banding if I have it. I didn't really come to talk about my own work. All right, so I'll just show you, I don't know if this is the one. 
Oh, no, that's not the one. My eyes are so bad that I can't even see my own stuff. But I actually don't have what I thought I had. So I, I apologize for that. But really, I was coming here to talk about existing federal, not, not contemporary. So my apologies. Other questions? Mm -hmm. People are credited for font styles. Are people credited for banding styles? Mm, I, I, I think or so. I, I, put this way, I think some people had unique bandings that were theirs. Um, like you have one that's yours. Right, which I wanted to show you, but I somehow lost it. So anyways. Um, but if you look at the cathedrals, which took you know, hundreds of years to make, there were carvers who did beautiful car. For years, it was the Garvin Carver. Well, it's, they don't know who you, you know, they didn't know who the person was. Mo most of the people who are working are anonymous, and you'll never know their names. And if there's a piece with somebody's l label on it, odds are better than not it wasn't made by them, it was made by their staff. It's, it's, just, it's just how it was. It's just how, it, which is fine, which is fine. So see, one, one thing people don't understand about professional cabinet makers is they think that you know we sit around saying, oh, okay, well now I think I'm going to make a card table next. No, you're making what the next order is. You're making whatever the, it, it's you're, you're, it's market driven. You may hate card tables, but if that's the next order, that's what you're going to make because that's just how it is. That's just how it is. So, other questions? Yes. Well, if you look at, all right, think of what you, the question was, how did they get the uniformity of, of the shading? Um, look at most period pieces. There's nothing uniform about it at all. It's all over the scale. It's all over the scale. But by paying attention, um, it was interesting. The gentleman I mentioned earlier, Mr. French, his wife did all the sand shading for him. So he would cut them out and she would do the sand shading. So she had a better eye. So, yes? Uh, my sand comes from Siesta Key, Florida. <laughs> it, seriously, it's a white sugar sand. A very, very, very fine sand. Um, not New Jersey sand. Okay, it's just, it's just too coarse. But you want a very, very, very fine sand. Yes. What, 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 all right, what I'm saying, the question is, how do you control the level when you put it in? Um, someone asked earlier, do you want the inlay to be you know, a little proud? Yes, you do, but when you're doing shaded pieces, you have to be very careful. Um, normally, what I'll do is I'll shade, and then I'll scrape the piece a little bit to see how deep the shading went, and then I'll put it in. Because you, what you do not want to do is, as you're flushing it to the surface, flush away all your sand shading. That is not what you want to do. So. Uh, it, it depends where you, you where you, the question was how large were the, some of the shops? Um, well, I'm going from memory on this, but I think that the Banks and Lawson shop had thirty some people. That was not typical of most shops. But I did read, like, Seed and Sons, which was in um, England, I think they had hundreds of employees. They were huge. And Gillows, these were huge enterprises. Over here, it was, I don't think it was ever that big. Uh, you know, I think typical today, a small handful of people working together. But, you know, they were subbing things out right and left. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, I use high glue, yeah, absolutely. For some things, it depends. If I'm doing this type of work, yes. If I'm doing uh, general cabinet work, no. No, hot hide. 192 gram strength. Yeah, this is a little water bath back here. All right. So this is a little water bath that keeps the glue at 100 and. Um, 40 degrees, and I discovered years ago that if I 
put my hot high glue in a plastic bottle and keep it in the water, I can use it pretty much like normal glue. But here is, um, is typical high glue. So I am using it hot, yeah. You, you can't, um, a lot of what we do is called a rub joint. You can't do a rub joint with room temperature high glue. It just, it takes too long for it to do its thing. So, but I, the, the answer to your question directly, yes, I still use hot high glue. 192 gram strength. I, I see we're looking at our watches, so I guess we're done. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. So, all right.